10 years, 7 years out of the family, blah, 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 earned money as a little tailor, sent it home, brought my grandmother, brought my father, and died at a very young age, 47, heart attack, you know, that's how these, yep, they work so hard, whatever. Now, then my father died at 57. Never really made it big in the country. Had a little store, what, 12 blocks from here on Ludlow Street, an antique store. And I wrote about it uh, in train tracks. It was all in that book. Owns this yacht. And I'm not here to boast. I'm just here to say it's the American dream. We have lived the American dream through extreme hard work. People don't know he works 24-7. My wife works 24-7. I shouldn't say it. Companies don't run themselves, as you know, whether it's Westwood One, Hachette, someone's running those companies. If salesmen aren't producing, they're fired, right? I heard silence go through. <laughs> I mean, if my son ran Westwood One, half of you wouldn't be here, for example. <laughs> I'll be the bad guy tonight. He just fired half his staff in New York today. But anyway, the point is... We're living the dream, but what my grandfather fled and his great-grandfather fled was communism, Bolshevism, revolution. What do we have in America today? We have $27 million apartments on Jane Street. I took a bicycle ride today. I saw a building. It was a former uh, nursing home, the painter told me. Red brick building looked like a school. So I said, how much do these cost? Are they condos? He said, no, man, they're for billionaires. How much are they? He said, $25 million for these two floors, and they're putting $5 million into it. I said, what? He said, yes, that's what they're putting into this building. This is what's going on. We have two societies, right? Three, maybe? High, low. God knows where the middle class is going to end up. But we have people who would like to stop that. We have people who would like to end it. We have like people who like to take it away, turn the city back, turn the country back. And the answer is somewhere in the middle, isn't it? Isn't it somewhere in the middle where everyone can dip their beaks, as the Godfather said, everyone can feed a little bit in our country? But we don't want Bolshevism. We don't want communism, do we? But we have the same forces that operated in Russia are now operating in the West. And that's what we have to be cognizant of. And that's what my show is about. It's not the extreme element of screw the poor, let them eat cake, let them eat peanuts. The issue is don't take from those who have worked so hard, don't steal it from them. Because without them, there'd be nothing. We'd have one salami in a butcher store like they had in the Soviet Union. Remember what Russia was like when you were a kid? Many of you were over 50. Remember the images of the Soviet Union? People lining up around the block, one salami in the butcher store. Why? Why would the butcher invest in a piece of meat? Why would the farmer raise the cows if he couldn't sell it and make a profit? People don't even understand what the profit motive is. It's not all evil. It's become a dirty word, right? Hasn't capitalism become a dirty word? Is it a dirty word? The whole world runs on that. So what I'm saying is, thank God we have a capitalist system. It's not evil. It's good. And I'm glad we're here. I'm not going to get to the gecko thing of greed is good. I'm not going. <laughs> I didn't go there. All I said was, capitalism is good. Investment is good. Business is good. Sales are, sales are very good. <laughs> Ratings are even better. And I want to thank you all for taking time out on a sweaty August day. It was a last minute thing. My son's boat was in Fort Lauderdale, and I conclude with this. And we're supposed to go on a father and son vacation. We've never done it. We're both afraid of each other. <laughs> We're both too hard-headed to spend any time in a tent. Hunting moose. Fishing. We don't like killing things. We like eating them, but not killing. So we were going to go to Alaska, then we were going to go to Canada. Then we said, what the hell are we going to do in Alaska? <laughs> well, there's, you can look at the hookers without teeth in the bar. What the hell? <laughs> well, what are we going to do in Canada? Well, there's always the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. I mean, I don't know. So he said, Dad, let me send the boat up to New York. I said, okay, that was last week. I said, okay, if you do, I'll invite my friends from Radio Cumulus, publishers, Kate, Hachette, and a few other people. And here you are, and you came on the last minute. It's a hot night. I'm sure you'd rather be getting ready for your Labor Day weekend. I want to thank you all for coming to join us here. And may we all enjoy the success that we deserve. Thank you very much for being here. And that's the personable Michael Savage with three drinks uh, under his sails. It was a hot, it was a hot August night, and the wine was very good. And the crowd was very nice. And it was a little different than radio. You can hear it. 
But it's a true story. It's an immigrant son, and it shows up with mobility. Now, you could say, oh, the decks were stuck because you're a white guy. Hey, everyone open the skids up for you. Well, it wouldn't be true if you thought that. It'd be true that you're thinking it, but it wouldn't be true because that's not what happened. I was blocked every step of the way. Whatever I did, I had to fight for. I had to fight for everything I ever did. And then, after I got my doctorate from a great university, I was told white men need not apply, so don't tell me the greases, the skids were greased for me. The opposite was true. In many cases, the skids were taken away from me and given to people like Barack Obama, and take a look at what we got from that. But nevertheless, it's not about Obama, it's about the American dream. It's very much alive, which is why millions of people are clamoring to break into our nation. Savage. Merry little Christmas. Let your heart be. You know what I really want to talk about? I want to talk about death and dying. Do you live with the idea of death and dying, or do you put it out of your mind? There was a book in the 1970s called The Teachings of Don Juan that many listeners who are of the liberal, ex liberal persuasion would have read. I wouldn't think that any conservative, over, young conservatives know that book. It's not that important. In the 70s, though, it was an interesting book. And it's about a um, a guy who goes into the uh, uh, areas of Mexico, and he meets an old uh, healer, a Mexican folk healer, by the name uh, a Yaqui Indian, who the author Castaneda was first introduced to at a bus stop in Yuma, Arizona. And so in the early 60s, he tells the story about uh, Don Juan and what the story is about. But it was a big book about peyote, which I've never used psychedelic mushrooms, Datura and Toyote, found in the Mexican deserts, which were allegedly used to reach states of non-ordinary reality in the teachings he conveyed to Carlos. When he goes into that other world, that dream world, he learns from this Corandero that people from the third world, especially primitive people from the third world, live with death all the time. We in the, in the world that we live in push it away. We don't want to know about it. We use sports, entertainment, whatever. Perhaps it's a healthier way. Who knows? But it's inevitable. So I will ask you a question. Last night I watched The Sopranos, Burt Young dies. And his son, the actor, cries and says he was young. He was only 71 and or he's 67. Then I watched another movie about a guy dying in his, his 60s or whatever. And I start to try to not think about it. But meanwhile, I have a, a, a dream, a horrible dream, about that I'm laying there in, a, in, in some funeral parlor and they want to embalm me. And I, I jump up from the embalming and I say, no, 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 you can't do me. You can't cut me open. And I, and I run out of the, uh, the, the home. And I say, what a crazy dream that is. So I, I said to myself, why should I do the news? Everyone can do the news. And yet there's not a listener to my show. I don't care whether you're young, old, black, white, gay, straight, man, woman, boy, man, man, boy, girl, dog, any conscious being, any conscious being lives with this all the time. And I want to know from you, the audience, a, do you really live with this, or is this considered too somber for you? Or is it too depressing for you? Do you run from this thought, or do you live with the thought? Have you come to terms with the thought? The real question for the audience that would be of interest, I think, is how do you live with your thoughts about death and dying? What are your coping methods? What do you do when the thought of your end comes to you? That's what I'd like to know. I think that that's as important a topic as any, because it's a topic that no one will talk about in America. And remember, this is a talk show. This is not about Obama and Harry Reid and Boehner and Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton and this one and that one. They're not the be-all and end-all of the world. Talk radio is about talk. It's about topics. It's not only about politics. At least that's what I think. So if you care to join the conversation on that topic, you can. I'll get to the news momentarily. Now, there, there are news stories. I mean, there's pretty good news out there, to be honest with you, but I'm not ready for it. I said to myself, I'm going to go and do a show the way I used to do it years ago when I first began. Do you know when I first began a radio in the 90s? I'm going to tell you the truth. I did very little show prep on some days. Some days I would tune out of the news. I would take a ferry from Marin County, California, into San Francisco. It would drop me at the ferry terminal. It, it, it landed at 2.55, if I remember correctly. And my show started at 3.05. I'd run across the street to the KSFO studios and be on the air within a minute of the mic going hot. And I would do some of my most intuitively fun shows, best shows, most entertaining shows, insightful shows that the audience came to love. But I want to open with this topic, which is death and dying. And I'd like to ask you, 
what are your coping methods for this topic? The reason I'm doing death and dying is very simple. Because I had a nightmare about being uh, embalmed, which is so freaky. And, uh, you know, you jump up with the whole inevitable thing, and then you push it away, use all your coping mechanisms, and then you run to the other side, which is choose life. But I said to myself, I can't be the only person in, the, in America who thinks about death and dying. I, I've been thinking about death and dying since I'm about six. I've always been focused on the next world, which is probably probably one of the reasons I'm so productive in this world. If you go back and look at my writings going back to when I was a teenager just writing journals, I always knew, you know, that there's uh, the time, tick, 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 the clock, the whole thing, the dolly picture, the clock, the bent clock. Any artist is aware of the whole idea of death. What do you think motivates artists? What do you think drives artists but the sense of, of time? It's all about time, and I'll take it to an another level with you. I want you to go to any website that you go f to for the news, whether, whether it's the Drudge Report, Fox News, Savage.com. If you look at any security, any, any story rather, it's all about your fear of death. Every story is about you, the human fear of death. I'll give you the headline, okay? NSA radio pathway to crack computer, says Drudge. Secret spy court judges want no changes. Okay, Obama says, trust me. What is that about but a fear of death and dying? It means the government is trying to, is to put a knife through your freedom, trying to ensnare you, trying to entrap you, trying to imprison you. That's what you fear. So it's a sense of a loss of freedom. And a sense of a loss of freedom is a sense of loss of life. And a sense of a loss of life is a fear of the other side. And so that's why I asked you, and the Savage Nation, I mean, look, I can do the news. I have the newspapers I'm going to get to today. I'm going to get to the newspapers, the uh, New York Times and the San Francisco Chronicle to show you the uh, omega of news and what it's become. We don't have any alphas anymore in the newspaper business. But almost every story in the newspapers is about a fear of loss of freedom or a fear of loss of death in one way or the other. Whatever it is, look at it and analyze it. But I don't think it's morbid to talk about death and dying. It's part of the human experience, it's like talking about birth and living. I could talk about birth and living, but most of us are not that interested in birth and living. What we do is we run every day as fast as we can away from the topic that I am talking about. We run from it with alcohol. We run from it with marijuana. We run from it with cocaine. We run from it with virtually every drug on the planet. Man has been running from the fear of death since man has been on the planet. Uh, one of my graduate interests and degrees is a master's degree in anthropology before I went on for another master's degree and then a Ph.D. I've always been interested in how other cultures view death and dying. And believe me, it's not the same as we view death and dying in this country. Most Americans walk around as though they're immortal. Most Americans talk as if they're immortal. Most Americans act as if they're immortal. And yet they know that they're not. Look at the women with the Botox and the surgery. Look at all of the surgery. What is that all about? What is all of this beautician, beauty treatment about? It's an attempt to control the aging process. And what about my obsession with food and vitamins? Well, obviously, it's because I didn't want to die at 40. I didn't want to die at 50. I, I wanted to make sure I could live as long as I could live ha uh, healthfully. Okay, so that's what that's about. It makes sense to try to keep yourself looking as well and feeling as well as you can. But the inevitable is there around the corner. So what do you do? Well, some turn to religion. What do you think theology is about? And what do you think prayer is about? Is prayer not about eternal life in another world? Whether you be a Christian or a Jew, don't you believe that that's what your prayer is about? Every prayer, if you read every prayer, it's about the next life. And if you're not a Christian and you're not a Jew, if you're a Buddhist, is it not about reincarnation? Is it not about the many lives that you've lived and the many lives you will live? And about karma, how you act here is how you'll be placed there? So these are very big, big, big topics, and I think it's a, a fabulous topic. I think it goes outside the ken of the average talk radio show, which is where I want to go every day. What I have found in my anthropology years, living in third world places when they were really third world places, where there was no electricity, no television, no radios, in uh, villages with straw mats, way back in the late 60s, collecting plants, medicinal plants. And I told a story once that I've had five or six near misses in my life. And nobody knows when the seventh one is coming or how many lives a cat has. But I remember in the Fiji Islands, I was coming back from a village where we had a Yangona ceremony all night. And something in me, 
Everyone fell asleep, and I said to my guest, I have to leave, I have to leave, I have to leave. And he said, where are you going? It's in the middle of the night. I said, I 